reading the book of Acts in 40 days. Let's go. Welcome to day 25 of reading through the book of Acts together. I'm so thankful that you're here. If this is the first video you're clicking on, don't worry, you can start right now. You don't have to start at the beginning. My name's Alex and I'm super thankful that you're here. I believe God is going to speak to you today, that he's gonna do incredible things in your life. And if you're one of those people that's been with us from the very beginning, you're watching every single video, of course, I'm so thankful that you're here too. In just a moment, I'm gonna read our passage for today, which is found in Acts chapter 19. And then after that, I'm going to share a few devotional thoughts, a few teaching thoughts that I really believe are going to encourage you and help bring this Bible passage to life. So if you want to hear the reading, stay right where you are, or if you've read it on your own, or you're just like, hey, I don't want to hear you talk any more than I have to, you can go to this timestamp right here, and that'll take you straight to the devotion, straight to the teaching content of this video, because I really, really believe that God's going to speak to you and do something incredible. So you can skip ahead right now or stay right where you are. And let's dive into the Word of God. Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Acacia before going to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. He sent his two assistants, Timothy and Arrestus, ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a while longer in the province of Asia. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in the trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, but as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak. But when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again and kept it up for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have not stolen anything from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges, and if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government, since there is no cause for all this commotion, and if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them, and they dispersed. The first thing I want you to notice is that Paul said he had to go to Rome because he was so compelled by the Spirit. He was so compelled by the Holy Spirit. He said, this is something I have to do. It's something I must do. So we need to realize that there are things in our life that the Holy Spirit may speak to us that we don't necessarily have to do. Maybe it's a suggestion. Maybe we feel led to do it. There were many places that Paul felt led to go. There were many places where he ministered and great things happened. But then there are also times in our life when the Spirit tells us that there's something we must do. And we have to be sensitive to these times because oftentimes going and doing what God has called us to do, what we're feeling in our spirit, won't feel good. It won't be exciting. It may actually scare us. This is a problem I have a lot of times when people say, well, just follow peace. Just, just follow peace. And 
I understand the peace of the Lord, but oftentimes what God calls us to do is not going to be peaceful in the natural. It's going to be scary. It's going to cause us to lose sleep. You even look at Jesus before he goes to the crucifixion. He knows that he's called to do it, but he gets so stressed out that he starts to sweat drops of blood. And so you can't tell me, oh, you're always going to feel good about what you're called to do. But if you know God has called you to do it, he's going to give you the power. He's going to give you strength, provision to make sure that you are able to accomplish. So is there something in your life that God has told you you must do? It may not be exciting. It may not seem like it's going to work out. It may actually scare you. You may not understand it. But if he's told you you must do it, you need to trust in him, seek after him, and do what he has called you to do. Push aside everything else, just like Paul. There were people trying to pull him other places. They wanted him to stay in this place. They wanted him to go to that place. And he said, no, I've got to push aside everything else, and I have to do what God has called me to do. What has God called you to do? Find that and then do it. The next thing I want to talk about is how the Christians, and this translation actually says the way, which was the early name for Christians, for followers of Jesus, followers of the way, the Christians started to make such a difference, such an impact in the culture of Ephesus that they actually started to drive idol makers out of business. And this was not a small business. This was not some mom and pop shop. This was one of the main industries for this city. There was idols everywhere. Everyone was connected with this idol making industry. They were connected with the supply line. They were connected with working in the temple. There's a whole thing we could go into about that. But I really just want you to understand the way of Jesus living as a Christian, it should impact the culture around us. You know, a lot of times we talk about revival and I think I'm thankful for revival in church. I'm thankful for revival in people's lives, but real revival, a real move of God starts to impact the city around it. It starts to impact the people around it. It's not just about the revival in the four walls of the church. It's not just about the revival in the home, but it actually starts to change the city. What if in your city, the drug dealers started getting mad at churches because they couldn't sell any more drugs? What if in your city, prostitution, the pimps started getting mad because what if in your city, the pimps started getting mad and the human traffickers started getting mad because the sex trade was closed down and no one was wanting to do any prostitution anymore and they started getting mad at the church? What if that were to happen? That's, that's what happened in the book of Acts right here and I believe that God can do that again. So let's start to believe that God can bring revival to yes, our homes, yes, our lives, us personally, yes, our churches, but he can start to change a city. The the power of God can begin to change so many people that the prisons are empty. Come on, the rehabs are empty. All of these different things that affect society. And, and we know these are problems in society. Everybody knows these are problems in society. But what if the gospel is true? What if the book of Acts is true? And I believe it is. Do you believe it's true? What if it's true and it could begin to change the culture of a city so much so that idolatry was taken away, addiction was taken away, sexual promiscuity was taken away, come on, teenage pregnancies were taken away. All of these different things could change because of the power of God. And so as believers, we need to start to pray and believe for that power. We need to start to pray and believe for that kind of impact in our cities, that it's not just about us having great services, but it's about the power of God breaking out and really starting to change a city and a culture to look more like the kingdom of heaven and less like the kingdom of darkness. That was day 25 of reading through the book of Acts together. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you subscribe to this channel, like the video and hit the bell notification. And then also all of the previous videos are in a playlist. So you can watch that playlist right now. Don't click anywhere else. Come on, don't go to another YouTube channel. Stay right here. I know you're going to enjoy it. I know God's going to speak to you until next time. I'll see you later.